a feeling of heaviness in my chest, a sharp pain that makes it hard to breathe. My heart beats a little faster, maybe even too fast. This is how my mind and my body often react to the constant feeling of social pressures and the fear of missing out. From PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs and WETA Wellbeings, this is On Our Minds with Matt and Faiza, a podcast about teenagers and mental health because life is hard and we're all going through something and hearing stories about what other teens are going through and how they're getting better, it helps. A note before we get started. Today, we're going to be discussing friendship, peer pressure, and the fear of missing out. Issues like anxiety and substance use come up in these conversations. If you or someone you know needs help, we have a list of resources at studentreportinglabs.org slash mental health resources. Also, we recommend you listen to this podcast with a friend or a trusted adult. Hi, Faiza. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm doing great today. It's very sunny out, so I got some time to go outside, so I'd say I'm in a pretty good mood right now. How are you doing? I'm excited. This is the second episode of season two. Do you feel like we're getting in the swing of things? I do. I was especially nervous at first, but I think that now we've had some recording under our belt, I think that it's only going to get better from here. Today, we'll be hearing a number of students talk about what they know best, different aspects of social life as a teenager how hard those moments can be when we feel left out, and how teen life is depicted in popular shows, like Euphoria. Up first, two friends, Temperance and Ethan. They're both from military families and talk about the challenges that come with that. We deal with a lot of things that normal kids don't. It definitely has its ups and downs. Yeah. Like, Definitely with like deployment or just moving from friends, family. It's it does have a toll, but it does have its greater outcomes. Mm. Um, like one of the outcomes is meeting new people, meeting you. Sadly, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> you want to define what deployment so is? So your active. Normally, when your active military parent goes away, normally overseas to a different country for about. Depending, it's normally months, but sometimes they can go for years. My dad just went on a recent deployment to Guitar. He left in March, and he didn't come back until like October 16th, I think. I have three younger brothers. One of them is autistic, and just having a dad, my dad, leave, it had a lot of pressure on me. I had a lot more responsibilities, a lot more pressure, but I got through it. We're going to move again. This is going to be like our fifth move, I think. At least with moving, you have distractions. You have chances to be someone else. Yeah. If your life is going downhill, it's probably good for like a fresh start. But if you're just like rising up, like I actually have friends here. And like I'm actually in a good school. I know some kids, it's very hard to do. You don't feel secure. Oh, no, you don't, don't feel like you, you don't know. feel like you fit in. We understand this is extremely hard and our parents they don't have a choice. We don't have a choice to move. It's in the military. It's the military, it's yeah. Wherever they need them. But I know for me, I always feel proud and honored that my dad's in the military and that yeah. I get this experience. So moral of the story is how do we cope with this? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's a little bit. But the community helps you out with people. You're pretty much like one big family. It's true. I'd say for people who go through this, you're not alone. Moving that much sounds really hard. Have you ever moved Faisa? Um, personally, I've moved just once in my life, and that was actually a few months ago. And even though I moved really close to one of my best friends, and we actually lived together for a month because uh, we were waiting for our house to be built, but I did lose a lot of the strong bonds that I had with the friends that 
used to live close to me and I remember every day we would ride back home from school and we would be singing karaoke and stuff like that but I barely get the time to talk to them in person now. How about you Matt? Have you ever moved? I've actually never moved before. I've always lived in this house but I have had to start over in terms of school because my town has a town high school and then we have a school in our county and I chose to go to that county school which means that I had to leave behind a lot of my friends in my town. So initially when I had moved I was feeling great because I had made a lot of new friends in my county school but the further and further I got into my years of high school, I started missing these old friends that I had and I just felt like there was no way for me to communicate with them anymore because I had broken those connections. But actually recently I started reaching out to people and I've been able to speak with them again, which is a really nice feeling. I'm glad you were able to re-establish those bonds and that shows that whatever your situation is, it's easy to feel like we're missing out of something. Yeah, FOMO, or fear of missing out. I get that when it seems like everyone else is doing something cool and I feel like I'm just sitting around at home. That's a feeling we're going to explore in our next story from Zion, one of the amazing Honor Minds co-hosts last year. We're so happy to hear from her again. So let's give it away to Zion and her story of overcoming the fear of missing out. I started comparing myself to others at a young age. Sometimes it would be small things. Even when someone would speak about hanging out with their friends on the weekends or being good at sports, a million thoughts would rush through my head. Why don't your friends hang out with you on the weekends? Why don't you do something like that? Thoughts like these drove me to try out for my school's track team. And I don't even like running. I even started inviting one of my friends to hang out on the weekends when I really didn't even want to hang out with that friend. Eventually, I realized I was just trying to compensate for what I thought I was lacking in myself and that these thoughts and feelings I was experiencing were an intricate blend of social pressures and the fear of missing out, better known as FOMO. So I spoke to my guidance counselor, Anna Merkel, here at the Frederick B. Pankow Center. Specifically, I talked to her about why she thinks people compare themselves to others, about where all of these comparisons even come from. A lot of the comparisons that we do are based on fear. There's, there's no published, this is what constitutes good human being. So there's nothing really to look at. So you're always kind of striving to say, is this good enough? Is that good enough? Am I good enough? And it's really funny because I don't think we look at our friends and our loved ones and evaluate them the same way we evaluate ourselves. So I might look at my sister and say, oh, look, she's so great because she did this thing. And then I'll look at myself doing that exact same thing and go, oh, it was terrible because it should have been cleaner and it should have been faster and it should have been, should have been, should have been, should have been, should have been. So I don't know how it gets to that point exactly. But we seem to have a need for orderliness, and I think part of that orderliness is knowing what's good and knowing what's bad and the need to categorize. Do you know what I mean? So then you want to categorize yourself. Is this good enough? Is this good? Is this bad? Is this terrible? Where do I fall on this scale? If you're looking around and doing the comparison in a healthy way, you kind of take a more holistic view and see that. See all the people who are striving hard and how miserable they are. And then see all the people who are going easy on themselves and how happy they are and say to yourself, which one do I want to be when I'm 80? Do I want to be a person who just always pushed and sort of scared everyone or always pushed and and gave myself heart disease? Or (laughs) do I want to be someone who can look back and go, now that was a good life, you know? And so if you can remember what it's for and that there really is nobody with a big checklist going, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Who's doing this? You don't have to either. Nobody else is. They're all concerned about themselves. It's okay. <laughs> I really don't want to look back on my life when I'm 80 and realize I spent a majority of my time comparing myself or feeling less than. Sometimes I wish I could see myself how others see me, like how my mom sees me. She didn't grow up with Instagram or Twitter or any of that stuff at all, and I feel like that made things a lot simpler for her. I spoke with my mom about FOMO and how so much has changed from the times when she was a teenager and now. Hey mom, can you tell me about how things were socially when you were my age? How did you guys communicate? Communicating in the 90s was much different than communicating in 2020. 
In high school, we write notes to each other and say, hey, can you meet me at this party? Or hey, can you meet me at Kelly's house? Once we got the idea of where we were going or what we were doing and things like that, then we moved as a group. And we didn't rely on our cell phones because we didn't have them. Once I got in college, I finally got a pager, a beeper, and someone would put the number in and it would say, call them back. And then you would call them back and you would talk over the telephone. So I think that the biggest difference is that we talked on the phones, we left urgent 911 pages to one another, and we would leave messages on, if you can believe it, an answering machine, and you'd have to listen to all the messages. Do you feel like the lack of in-person communication adds to how teens view each other since we mostly communicate through our phones? I do. I think that that has a huge effect that they don't have those in-person interactions with one another. Because if you're just texting, you can't see a person's facial expression. Like someone can say, oh, I'm okay. And you can look at your friend and totally know she's not okay. And that leads you into a bigger conversation or a more intimate conversation saying, hey, friend, what's really going on? Did you ever experience FOMO when you were my age? No, I actually never have had FOMO. I never put myself in a category as other people, as if I was were to miss out on something someone else was doing. I kind of marched to my own beat and what others were attempted to do or did really um, didn't affect what I was doing. Did you know anyone or have any friends who experienced FOMO? My two best friends <laughs> compared themselves to each other all the time and we would talk about it all the time. Like, hey, this friend is good at this and this friend is good at that. So we would build each other up instead of saying, hey, you're better at something than I am. And also during the 80s and 90s, we compared ourselves to celebrities. I mean, everybody wanted to be TLC. Everybody wanted to be Janet Jackson. But I think the lesson learned was that you're okay. Who you are is definitely fine. How does it make you feel as my mother, knowing that I compare myself and experience FOMO? Well, I like to talk to you about it. I like to talk to you about, let's emphasize your greatness. Because in all honesty, you are only in competition with yourself. Your greatest concern should be your happiness, not if someone else is doing something that could possibly make you happy because that's not how it works. Why do you think I compare myself to other people? I don't know, because you shouldn't. I, I think that we emphasize in this household and in, in our home that you're a great human being and you shouldn't compare yourself to others because only Zion can do what Zion does. Realizing you have unhealthy habits can be hard to hear and coping with them can be even harder. I know for me, one thing I like to do is meditate on my feelings and process them to understand how they are affecting me and how I can improve them. Another method that I have yet to try out is journaling, which can also be an effective way of processing your emotions. Most importantly, I think realizing that being yourself and correcting those negative thoughts when you have them is the key to stop comparing yourself to others and getting rid of any FOMO. And honestly, from my experience, it is so much more freeing and makes life so much more enjoyable when you stop competing in an imaginary competition and just run to the finish line regardless if your competitors are running faster than you. I really appreciate those tips that Zion left at the end there, like meditation and journaling. I've always wanted to do meditation, but I feel like that's never really worked out for me. But I did pick up journaling recently. I bought a journal for my New Year's resolution, and I think it's a really good way for me to jot down what I'm feeling, and it's a good way to sort out my thoughts. I was wondering, Faiza, do you ever do anything like that for your mental health? I don't exactly journal every day, but when I do, and I definitely try to, I feel more calm and collected, especially at the end of the day. And when I want to relax and unwind, I often watch TV, but sometimes I choose shows that aren't exactly relaxing, like I can't stop thinking about the end of Euphoria. I'm really excited for season 3 to start, which I feel like is going to be in forever, but there's so many unfinished storylines and I really want to find out what happens with all these characters. But that being said, I mean, there is a lot of difficult subject matter, so it is a heavy show to watch, but I think that the show is visually stunning, the characters are really interesting, and overall it's pretty fun to watch. 
Yeah, fun and stressful to watch. That's exactly what our next conversation is about. Euphoria and how it tackles the issues we're covering in On Our Minds. We have Tatiana from Maryland here to take it on. Here she is with her friends Arielli and Dream. Why are you a fan of Euphoria? It doesn't really try to hide from anything. You can see yourself in like at least one character. I really love the artistic side. The cinematography is so beautiful. Euphoria is an Emmy-winning HBO series that premiered in 2019 and just wrapped up its second season earlier this year. It follows the story of Rue, a teenager in the throes of active addiction and the lives of her high school peers. What parts of the show match up with your high school experience? The problems that everyone goes through. I can relate to, for example, like the mental health part, which I think all the characters go through. I feel like almost every high school can relate to that. The deeper messages behind it, like the mental health, that is something they did really well, I feel like, with maybe like Kat's character, with how she struggled with her self-image. I feel like that's something every high schooler, like especially every high school girl, struggles with. And I think they portrayed it in a nice, well, not a nice way, but a way that it hits home. Rue uses drugs to escape her other mental health struggles. This show is really gripping because of the mix of music and dark, moody cinematography, plus voiceover from Rue as if the audience is actually inside her head. For an example, here in the very first episode describing why she gets high. Warning, this clip uses vivid imagery to describe drug use. And every time you breathe, you breathe out all the oxygen you have. And everything stops. Your heart, your lungs, and finally your brain. And everything you feel and wish and want to forget, it all just sinks. Critics say the show makes doing drugs look cool, but fans don't always see it that way. Even if there's some extra glitter, the mental health and substance use struggles the characters face are relatable. It's stuff we go through and we watch our friends go through, and it makes our lives harder. Weed in our generation, or like in high school, is the most accessible and the one that gets like the results that you want. There's other drugs that I know people do a lot, like acid, drinking. I don't really know a lot of people do pills, but or even like vaping. I feel like vaping is underplayed. It's seen as like silly because like the flavors are like fruity pebbles or like something funny, but it's actually like just as damaging as cigarettes. And I've known people who've gone through like nicotine withdrawals from vaping and they weren't happy. Like I saw them itching. I do have a friend which, you know, she had to kind of stop smoking because she wasn't really liking how it affected her or her mood. That was really interesting to see because I feel like people who smoke don't really do that and you especially don't see that in teenagers where they kind of take the initiatives kind of say hey i don't really like how this is making me feel in the long run uh, of course i'm like really happy for her but i also thought it was interesting to see since you don't see that in kids as much not saying that teenagers don't really care about their bodies but you know it's like if at the moment it makes you feel good it's very easy to look over how it might make you feel after I've seen like close friends of mine smoke weed or like have edibles, drink, you know, vape. In ninth grade, I think like kind of being surrounded by that, I felt left out most of the times because I didn't smoke weed. And so like, you know, whenever they went somewhere to buy it or like went somewhere to smoke, I wouldn't really join in. I don't think they were excluding me on purpose because like I know they mean well, but it was just like most times like I felt left out because I, I just didn't do those like kind of things with them. And, you know, I had thoughts about doing it with them to just kind of like fit in with the group because again, I just didn't like, you know, kind of the isolation. How it affected me is just like dealing with like loneliness because you're not like a user. Do you think teens should be allowed to watch Euphoria? It depends on the person. Like I actually watched like the first half a season two with my mom <laughs> sitting next to me well as it came out like at nine and I think it was interesting because 
we had such different reactions, and I think it's definitely because of our age. When Ash was beating up Cal, I was like, woo! And my mom was like, isn't he gonna get like consequences from that? So it's kind of funny, like maturity levels of it made watching it very different than watching it alone. Like, I feel like I process it different. At the end of the day, yes, it's a show, but I think that you can really take a lot away from it, like how to treat people with mental health issues and drug addiction problems. There are some teens who've went through that. So I feel like it's so cliche, but I really do feel like some people kind of don't know. They, they need to know that they're not the only ones that are going through the same things. As teenagers, we have like addictions to phones or like people, relationships, bad habits. And then I think that's like the main point how we cope. We just get something that we're obsessed with and then we can focus on that instead of all the bad stuff that we have in our life. You start catching yourself, um, kind of reminding yourself of Rue and like her actions. So I feel like you think of how Rue ended up and you don't want to end up like that. Arielli is right. It can be hard seeing the situation Rue finds herself in. I like watching the show. But listeners should know that it can be very heavy and triggering, and it might not be appropriate for everyone. What's most important is to take care of your mental health and reach out to others if you need help. I feel like we definitely need a regular TV show review segment with Tatiana, Ariely, and Dream. There's so much to say about euphoria and the dramatics of it, but also like the mental health aspect of it. And it's kind of interesting how we consume media in general or how it often feels like media consumes us. Which is actually the topic of Disha's next one-on-one -on -one conversation that will be coming out next. Yep, Disha spoke with Dr. Hina Talib about how consuming media on our phones affects our well-being. I know I need to hear that, so I'm sure it's one you won't want to miss. <laughs> Today's stories were produced by Temperance and Ethan from Caesar Rodney High School in Camden, Delaware. Zion from the F.B. Pankow Center in Clinton Township, Michigan, with help from Mercedes Azizi. And Tatiana from John F. Kennedy High School in Silver Spring, Maryland. This episode was produced and edited by Associate Youth Media Producer Becky Wandell, with help from Bridget Gansky. Executive Producer Leah Klapman, SRL Senior Director Elise Estrada, and the rest of the Student Reporting Lab staff. Music by Blue Dot Sessions. Once again, if you or someone you know needs help, we have a list of resources available at studentreportinglabs.org slash mental health resources. And tell your friends about us. Spread the word. The more people who know about mental health, the better.